Right, so privacy implications of, of artificial intelligence. Um, great topic I'm looking forward to presenting today. Before we get into it, uh, just a wee bit of background about myself. Uh, my name is Henry Leonard and I'm a senior privacy consultant here at, at Two Black Labs. Uh, I'll be giving today's presentation, obviously. Um, I haven't actually always worked in privacy. I, I started my career as a corporate lawyer, but I've I'd done a master's in human rights and data protection law at, um, while I was studying at Otago. So I, I wanted to move back into the privacy space from corporate law and then fortunately uh, managed to move to the Ministry of Social Development, uh, where I worked as a senior privacy advisor uh, before moving to Two Black Labs last year. Um, I note that we will be considering some human rights and ethics issues today. Uh, but I'll be presenting more directly on those topics next week. So I hope to see you then too. That will be the final session from our Lunch and Learn series. And um, so as a quick overview of today's presentation, um, first we're going to build some common understanding. Uh, we're going to look at what AI is, um, where it's used, and then the key benefits that it produces. From there, we'll move to some, um, some key privacy risks of AI. We'll focus on four main areas. Uh, first being collection, uh, the second being use and disclosure. Uh, then we'll look at transparency. And then finally, we'll move on to accuracy and bias. So I'll talk about um, case studies for each topic that we, uh, that we come to. And then at the end, I'll give some general and hopefully pragmatic advice for implementing AI. So, um, so I kind of want to frame this before we get into it and say that this isn't a futuristic talk. Um, AI is actually an old field. We'll certainly look to the future today, um, but it's been around since the middle of the 1950s. Um, there have been previous hype cycles and then periods of, of disappointment and criticism followed by uh, funding cuts and then renewed interest some years later but it's um but it's certainly being used uh, right now in government in the private sector it's not something we need to think about uh, now so that we're ready to implement in 10 years time uh, it's already here and it's been here for a while um, i, I want to frame today's talk as well by saying that there are a lot of ai risks that need to be looked at globally uh, i think some of the Big ones are how AI might restructure the labor market or um, worsen inequality, uh, you know, or even wipe out the human race, probably at the more serious end of the, of the scale. But what we're going to look at today is the, the privacy considerations um, for building AI and implementing it. So this is AI where personal information is involved. Um, so that's information about identifiable individuals. So we won't be looking at AI systems that predict weather patterns, but we will be talking about AI systems that decide whether a particular person might get a bank loan or be investigated by police. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, loosely, it's intelligence exhibited by machines or software, and there are two main types that we work with. There's weak AI, which is a, a system that can only complete a narrow task. So, um, you know, a chess engine or perhaps a system which can determine whether an, uh, an image represents a benign or a malignant tumor. Um, this is what we have now. Uh, and then there's also strong AI or general AI. Uh, this is more the future state that we see in movies and its intelligence to solve problems in multiple different domains. So that's a system that can, can complete generalized tasks which are asked of it. We'll be focusing on narrow AI today because that's where the technology is currently at. Um, but look, there's a real issue here and we might all be thinking about something quite different when we talk about AI. You know, the, the Terminator, um, self-driving cars, uh, slightly better ad targeting. E each is a valid example of AI. And I think that 
confusion, confusion arises for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, first, there are very deep unresolved questions about what intelligence actually is, which makes things difficult. Uh, second, AI is an incredibly cross-functional field. So you have, um, you have data scientists, programmers, ethicists, uh, engineers, statisticians, lawyers, uh, and then of course, uh, privacy specialists, uh, all trying to communicate in a common language, which isn't easy. Third, AI is really a, a suitcase word. So it encompasses a wide range of subfields. There's machine learning, um, natural language processing, deep learning, neural networks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, when people make claims about AI, they might just be talking about a narrow example of it. And then the fourth complexity, what is considered AI keeps changing. Um, so once a lot of cutting edge AI gets filtered into general applications, for some reason people stop calling it AI. This happened with um, optical character recognition, and it's happened with other technology too, which makes things difficult. But with all that in mind, we're going to forge on and we're going to use kind of a very high level definition of AI. So intelligence exhibited by machines or software. Where is, intelligent, uh, where is artificial intelligence used? The point I want to make here is everywhere. It's in the private sector, it's government, not the profit, it's, it's really ubiquitous. Um, so AI recommends you books, it determines what ads you see online, uh, it helps with stock management, it finds you an Uber driver, it checks your work for plagiarism, uh, you know, we use it to uh, unlock our phones um, you know, by showing our face, uh, it stops your inbox being flooded with spam, uh, chess.com uses it to teach chess, MSD uses AI to target some of its services, and then banks use AI to detect fraud and provide chatbot advice. So you know, it really is used in a lot of domains. And so, and so what are the benefits? And I think the benefits are really important. And today we're largely going to look at the risks of AI, but we need to remember that there's a, a huge amount of value that's already being contributed by AI by AI and will continue to be contributed. And so I don't want to come across as, as negative or, or pessimistic. Um, and on this point, I had a really interesting conversation with Professor Tim Dare, who's a, an ethicist at the University of Auckland. We were talking about um, Weapons of Math Destruction, which is a, it's a great book. It's about the, the worst examples of AI gone wrong. Uh, and I told him it was a great book, but he, he changed my framing. Um, it's very easy, I think unfortunately easy in this space to point to examples of AI done poorly, uh, but we can't lose sight of the benefits of when it's done well. Um, so, so what can AI do? Well, it can reduce human error, um, improve accuracy. Uh, we can have AI take risks instead of humans. So um, for example, a, a robot could diffuse a bomb or explore an ocean trench rather than having a human put themselves at risk. AI can work on the clock, can do those sort of more repetitive or boring jobs. AI can reduce bias in human decision making, which we'll um, absolutely be talking about later. And AI can also make faster decisions and at scale. So I think there should be a lot of positivity around AI. And I think this is an interesting quote. This is from the recent algorithm assessment report that um, the Department of Internal Affairs and, and Stats did. They, they opened with this observation. Algorithms have an essential role in supporting the services that government provides to people in New Zealand and in delivering new, innovative and well-targeted policies to achieve government aims. Um, I think that's a big claim, but I, but I think it's accurate. Um, and look, there are some really positive stories around. So. Uh, locally, uh, here in Wellington, we have Volpara Health Tech. Um, they use AI to more effectively identify breast cancer. I think um, medical imaging is an area of AI development that's shown incredible um, practical benefits. Uh, Cuventus, uh, they use AI to optimize patient movements. 
Um, so for example, there, software can optimize an ambulance route to ensure the driver uh, reaches the patient and then drives them back to the hospital as quickly as, um, as possible. So that's an example of AI and humans working together. Further down the line, you can see that that ambulance might be a self-driving vehicle. And then perhaps taking the next step uh, would be uh, you know, AI paramedics or AI doctors in the, in the back, perhaps. Um, there have been some interesting advances in war as well, um, particularly with case prediction software, which perhaps isn't something people normally think about when they think of AI. Um, but you know, one such uh, piece of software can predict with 80% accuracy um, the outcomes of cases before the European Court of Human Rights, just when fed the facts of cases. And then perhaps even more impressively, uh, a similar system had better luck in predicting the rulings of the US Supreme Court than a group of 83 legal experts, half of whom uh, had actually previously served as the justices' law clerks. Uh, so there are, there are a huge suite of benefits. To realize these benefits, people need to trust the technology. So let's look at the risks. Um, and the risks that I pull out are not exhaustive. They're a, a snapshot of the privacy risks which can arise with AI. Uh, we're gonna start with collection. So collection risks can occur when developing the AI, you know, when building it, but also when using it. And so in privacy, it's, it's really a foundation that you should only collect the information that you need and you should collect it directly from the individual and collect it in a fair manner. But with many AI systems, the general approach is the more data, the better. And so organizations scrape information from, from everywhere, some of it public, some of it private, some of it lawful, some of it not. Um, so for our first case study, we'll have a quick look at Clearview AI, um, which is topical and I, I think a classic example of collection risks. Um, so for those of you that don't know the way Clearview AI works, um, and it's used a lot by law enforcement, is that you take a, a picture of a person and then upload it, and you get to see public photos of that person along with links to where those photos appeared. And so the system whose backbone is a database of more than 3 billion images uh, that Clearview claims to have scraped from Facebook, uh, YouTube, Venmo, and, and millions of other websites goes far beyond anything um, constructed previously by the US government or Silicon Valley giants. But some really interesting collection questions arise. So is collecting photos of millions of law-abiding citizens acceptable or should the collections only be from known criminal databases? Is it appropriate to take images from Facebook against the website's terms and conditions? Should photos on Facebook um, be considered public? What if the user didn't have the skills or awareness to set their privacy settings differently? What if it was an employee whose photo was uploaded to their employer's Facebook page and then scraped into an AI, um, Clearview AI database? You know, or perhaps a young child who doesn't actually have a Facebook account but is named in their cousin's Christmas photo or, or something similar and then now they're in the database. Is that okay? These are really difficult questions but very clear collection risks when you're pulling that much information from so many sources. Use and disclosure. Um, so you should only use or disclose personal information for the purpose it was collected for, but there's a big problem here because with AI, there's often these new valuable new purposes that you could use um, or disclose the information for, particularly where you have a you know, a large data warehouse of information. Um, and you also get organizations holding on to information for, uh, you know, as long as possible with the hope that one day there might be uh, some valuable use for it on the horizon. Um, and, you know, with developments in AI, that, that may well be true. Uh, 
but just because information might have value in a new context or in the future uh, doesn't mean it's appropriate to use the information in a new way particularly where you didn't tell the individual at the time how you were going to use that information so here's a here's a case study to think about some of these risks um, say your organization's developed a smart fridge that uses AI technology. It's a, it's a very smart fridge. Um, it scans the contents of the fridge and determines um, what food is about to go off uh, and what temperature it should be kept at. And so it, it then knows when to reorder food and, and does that on your behalf. But it can also sort of recognize which arm has reached into the fridge and determine um, you know, who's grabbing what bit of food. And so, you know, it knows what time of day you're doing that as well. Perhaps it sees an arm getting slightly chubbier over time. Um, there's a lot of information that can be, that can be, that can be stored there and then perhaps used, perhaps used for other purposes. So, you know, your organization owns the smart fridge and then it partners with a health organization that uses AI to provide tailored health advice based on food consumption. You can see you know, perhaps a shameful alarm goes off when you put too much alcohol in the fridge or, or high fat milk. Um, perhaps you get reminders that you need to eat more dark green vegetables because your fridge thinks you're unhealthy. You know, is this appropriate? And then when, when might it be inappropriate? What if instead of partnering with a health organization you decide to work with an insurance organization. So you sell them the food consumption information of particular households. They then use their AI systems to adjust the insurance premiums they charge to those households. Is that appropriate? What if well-off families can buy the smart fridge for a more expensive price and so they get to keep their personal information secure, but then Poorer families are offered a cheaper deal, but they have to sell their food consumption and their health information to pay. Is that appropriate? I'll leave that with you for a moment. Inaccuracy and bias issues. So we know that decisions should be made on the basis of accurate information, but unfortunately, Information used to build AI can be incomplete, inaccurate, misleading, uh, you know, which leads to, to biased AI. Equally, you, you could use accurate and complete information to build your AI, but then bias creeps in in some other way, resulting in biased decisions. So we'll, we'll look at a couple of case studies. And um, look, inaccuracies are, are bad, but inaccuracies which have disparate impacts on different groups are particularly bad. Um, so consider the often cited work by investigative journalists at ProPublica. So they examined a, a criminal justice AI called Compass. Um, Compass is used in the, in the US mainly and it gives risk, uh, risk scores about the chance uh, an offender will commit a crime in the two years after the assessment. So difficult assessment, uh, but a very interesting area. And I think the appeal there is obvious. Um, key decisions in the legal system have been in the hands of human beings guided by their instincts, their personal biases uh, for generations. So if an AI could accurately predict which defendants were likely to commit new crimes, uh, that would be great. The criminal justice system could be fairer, more selective about who was incarcerated and for how long. The trick, of course, is to make sure the AI gets it right. If it's wrong in one direction, we have a dangerous criminal going free. Uh, if it's wrong in another direction, it could result in someone unfairly receiving a harsher sentence or waiting longer for parole than is appropriate. Um, so the investigative journalists, ProPublica, they obtained risks uh, risk scores assigned to more than 10,000 people in um, a county in Florida, and then they checked to see how many were charged with new crimes over the next two years. So only 20% of the people predicted to commit violent crimes went on to do so. 
So that's 80% of the people who were labelled highly likely to commit violent crimes in the next two years didn't. And then also the AI mislabeled African-American defendants as high risk at nearly twice the rate it mislabeled white defendants. So inaccuracy is an issue, but these disparate impacts make it even more serious. Um, consider another case study, uh, PredPol, which is used by police, again, largely in the US, um, to predict crime. So this isn't detecting and responding to a crime, it's, it's upstream, it's predicting where crime might occur, you know, quite futuristic, uh, could be useful. Uh, it's a collaboration between the LA Police Department and then a group of criminologists and mathematicians at University of California. Um, so the hope, which is a good one, I think, is that it will bring down crime rates and reduce the human bias in policing. Uh, and so the way it works is it sends cops to areas where crime is predicted to occur. But there's a clear feedback loop here. If an officer is sent to a, a neighborhood and then makes an arrest, the software takes this as indicating a, a good chance of more crimes in that area in the future. But the crime rate might not be higher than elsewhere. It might just be that there are more police and so a, an arrest is more likely to be made. Um, and then we have this underlying issue that historic police data is notoriously biased to begin with. Uh, but unfortunately, there's this huge cloud of secrecy. So the vendor won't allow people to properly inspect the AI. And then um, police departments are also refusing to say whether or not they're using the technology. Um, but it's been claimed that uh, some 60 police departments around the USA are using it. So it is having a serious impact. Transparency. Uh, you should be transparent with the individuals whose personal information you collect and then use. You should tell them what you're going to do with it and why you made a particular decision about them. And I think this is all the more important when you have technology that can be as complicated as AI can be. Um, we want to know who is accountable for decisions made and we want to know how those decisions are made. And um, particularly, I think, when we're made worse off as a result of those decisions. So as a case study, consider an AI system which predicts whether an individual should get a loan. Uh, and then this AI has uh, been built to improve itself over time. Perhaps it was developed by a team of programmers and data scientists. Uh, they've since left the organization and also no one particular person was on the project for the entire duration. Put yourself in the shoes of the person who's being tasked with writing a transparency statement. You're getting pressure from above saying that you, know, you can't reveal any confidential IP uh, that the bank might own in relation to the AI. How on earth would you make a meaningful transparency statement to someone who's had their application for a loan declined? Um, difficult, uh, very difficult. Um, but I, th I think that's enough of the, the risks of the, of the difficulties. Uh, let's look at some remedies and some um, tips. So the, the risks we looked at, just to just remember, they were four key areas, collection, use and disclosure, inaccuracy and bias, and then a lack of transparency. So with transparency, I think we need to acknowledge that it's it's difficult, that you need to do your best here. And there isn't an easy answer, and you're gonna to have to work with the programmers and the data scientists. It's a cross-functional area, uh, but there are some simple steps you can take. So I think you need to be really clear about the type of data which is feeding your AI, um, you know, where that data comes from. Is it just from the individuals themselves, perhaps from a form, or is it pulled from multiple parties um, or historic data sets. It's a really good idea to have a layered privacy notice as well. So a simple um, initial explanation up front and then more detail sitting in behind for those who want it. And you can put a human in the loop who might make a, a decision partly on the basis of a, an AI recommendation say, and then partly on other measures and then they're tasked with 
using their judgment. And I think that's good because it has a, a due process feel to it. But there's some complexity there too. It's not a cure-all um, and it might actually make the systems less accurate. It's difficult to ensure you have a sort of an optimal relationship between the humans and machines, not one with humans as, as passive partners. Um, there's a bit of research around which suggests humans begin to trust automated systems so much they often ignore other sources of information including their senses and it's certainly easier you know say if you put yourself in the shoes of a judge um, i think it's easier for that judge to follow the recommendations of an algorithm which says this prisoner is a danger to society uh, rather than that judge to really look through all the details of the prisoner's record herself and then ultimately decide to to free them um, on the transparency front too, I think you can move the goalposts slightly and be transparent about uh, why you think the AI works um, as opposed to being transparent about exactly how it works. So, you know, personally, I'm more interested in knowing whether a cancer detecting scanner is, is accurate uh, rather than knowing how it determines uh, whether I have or don't have cancer. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether that slight shift of focus becomes increasingly common um, with AI. But look, there, there is considerable debate as to whether it's possible to actually be transparent with many AI systems. Um, and in fact, sometimes organizations might make a decision to limit the performance and accuracy of an AI system if it makes it easier to explain. Uh, and so there's a kind of quite a fundamental question there as to whether transparency should be pursued and I think it partly depends on the context. Um, losing accuracy to provide transparency might be more acceptable in a loan situation perhaps than in a, a medical context but you know that's not necessarily so. Um, I think on this transparency point it, it, it's worth noting for completeness that human decisions are often uh, really difficult to probe or review as well. Um, you know, people might lie about the factors that they considered, uh, or they may not understand the factors that influence their thinking. Uh, it can be quite easy to hide behind one particular fact or factor and then not admit or, or not even realize that other less appropriate factors actually played a, a larger role. Um, but I think people are relatively tuned in uh, to seeing bias in human decision making, whereas with tech for some reason we we think the technology is is neutral which it isn't um you know some people think technology is neutral it's how you use it but that misses such a crucial step which is that technology can be designed in a way which encourages uses which are um, absolutely not neutral understand your legislative environment so there are plenty of existing New Zealand laws, including the Privacy Act, uh, that may apply to your use of AI. And um, this isn't an unregulated area by any stretch. Um, so consumer protection law, human rights law uh, may be relevant, depending on your context. Uh, there's a considerable body of law around discrimination. Um, don't think you're operating in an unregulated space just because the technology feels new. Um, I should also note for those in the in the public sector, um, a legal barrier to automated decisions can arise where statutory powers cannot be delegated or, or, or fettered in certain situations. So um, you might need to put a, a human in the loop rather than having a, um, a solely automated decision. Um, Again, for those in the public sector, consider your transparency obligations under the Official Information Act. Um, so people have a right to reasons for decisions made by official agencies. If you've procured an AI system from a vendor and you're not allowed to tell anyone how it works, that might be a real issue. Um, it's important to have an international lens here as well. Um, if you're in scope for GDPR, uh, then you might be required to undertake a, a privacy impact assessment for your use of AI. So that requirement applies to, to novel technology and high risk uses of data, which um, AI will often be included in. Um, 
there are also other GDPR obligations for um, automated decision making, which might apply, such as um, providing an individual affected by a decision with recourse to a human who can review the decision and explain its logic. I think it's really important to consider the bad outcomes up front. Um, you know, it's very tempting just to look at the, the benefits, but you, you really need to dive into how things might go wrong. So um, something I recommend is abusability testing. So you yeah, think about how someone might misuse the technology. So if you have a chatbot on Twitter, are people gonna teach you to swear um, and adopt xenophobic beliefs? In, in Microsoft's case in 2016, absolutely, yes. Um, people will teach you those things. Um, but then there's, a, there's another issue there where, uh, you know, if you don't think carefully about profanity filters, um, what might the implications be if certain profanity filters stop people communicating with certain words in te reo? Um, you know, it's a, it's a complicated area. Um, consider to a, a COVID-19 contact tracing app, very topical, but let's say this one uses AI to predict um, who should go and get tested um, based on the time they've spent in close proximity to those who have tested positive. You know, are people going to refuse to dob themselves in as infected in the app? Um, you know, probably, if they're embarrassed, everyone they've been in contact with might figure out that it, it was them that, that spread the virus. Um, taking a more political step, could you even shape voting patterns by falsely reporting infections near voting booths, say in regions with particular political sways? Um, in terms of bad, out bad outcomes, from a bias perspective, I think it you know, can be a good move to exclude protected characteristics such as you know, race from training data, but again, absolutely not a cure-all because a lot of other variables serve as close proxies for protected characteristics. Something I think is really important with AI is you shouldn't be afraid to abandon a project. Um, some AI systems are difficult or even impossible to retrain, and so they need to be abandoned if things do go wrong, with lessons learned, of course. Um, Amazon did this with their AI recruitment software. So it was trained on historic data, which had a bias for men, particularly in, in the more technical roles. And so the AI then, because of that data, learned to give lower rankings uh, if, a, if a resume had woman in it, you know, say woman's first 11 football team. Uh, the AI also gave lower rankings if the applicant went to an all-female college. Um, and so Amazon decided to abandon the project completely rather than tinkering with the AI and trying to get it back on track. And that's a, a hard but often a smart decision, um, just given those, those difficulties with, uh, with retraining. And I, I think part of that is that it's important to manage expectations up front. Um, you know, certain uses of AI are hard to get right, they're complex, and you know, if, sometimes they do need to be abandoned. You don't want a situation where everyone feels a lot of resources have been, have been spent, um, there's a lot of energy around it, and so people forge on and then release something that produces bad outcome. Consider ethics. Um, I think ethics should be explicitly considered when designing and implementing AI. And in particular, I think a really important question to ask is who might be made worse off as a result of your AI? So a couple of examples. Um, consider a, an optimization problem of where, where you should relocate underused social services uh, based on the location of users. So, an AI might suggest, let's move the services from rural to more urban areas, we'll be able to serve more individuals. This absolutely sounds reasonable, but does the benefit outweigh the harm to those of rural individuals who are now more isolated and less able to access an alternate service? Um, is it okay to use everyone's data to benefit a select group and then, and then harm, harm others? Um, these trade-offs, I think, need to be explicitly considered with documented justifications. Don't 
hide behind the AI, um, don't hide behind arguments about efficiency. Um, consider a slightly different optimization problem. Um, this time, a council needs to decide where it should provide walking tracks and roads in a town. And so, using cell phone data to view flows of individuals it appears to be a, a very reasonable option. But think about who might not be captured by your data. Um, perhaps older individuals are more likely to leave their phones at home when they go for a walk on their favorite trail. Um, so the council doesn't know if those trails are being used and then so they receive less maintenance as a result, increasing the risk of falls. Um, what about those individuals who just don't have smartphones? How often are their preferences excluded from analysis? Um, think back to that. COVID tracing app, if the main form of tracing is via smartphones, what does that mean for people uh, who don't have them? And then next question is, are those individuals more likely to come from vulnerable groups? Quite possibly. And I think consent is a really interesting ethical issue for AI as well. Um, your project should be very careful if it relies on getting consent. Um, particularly of vulnerable groups, so from employees or from younger people, say, when using technology that can be complicated, it's really difficult to ensure consent is informed and unambiguous. And on the consent front, something to think about for the future is, you know, I, I expect we might see these types of solutions is, could you train an AI with your consent preferences and then the AI um, makes decisions on your behalf as you move through the digital space as to what you want to consent to or what, you, what terms you want to accept. So the AI agent could read terms and conditions for you, consent to some, um, reject some outright, and then flag certain clauses and borderline cases for, a, um, for your decision. And then obviously it would uh, learn your preferences more closely over time. And an interesting idea, I think. Um, data governance. If you want to design and implement AI successfully, um, you need strong data governance. And so when I say data governance, I mean the rules and policies your organization has for how it handles information. Um, for AI in particular, there should be really clear oversight and sign off um, for developing and using it. Uh, vendor risk assessments, if you're, if you're using a third party. Um, clear retention and disposal process, and this might be de-identification rather than deletion. Um, and then of course, so important, um, a really strong privacy by design approach. So that includes a, a privacy impact assessment for each project. And um, you know that PIA should be kept up to date as more information is made available about how the AI system is performing. Um, it shouldn't be a, a classic um, sign off once and then forget about it. Um, right, we're going to have a look at the Clearview AI case study again and see how strong data governance could have improved things. Um, so this was, this was trialled by um, police uh, and it's, it's been in the media recently, uh, so topical. Um, firstly, clear oversight and sign off. Andrew Costa, the police commissioner, um, he had to tell John Edwards that he was unaware of the Clearview AI trial by police. That's a painful conversation to have. Um, it's so important to have a, a clear documented sign-off process for evaluating uh, and then adopting new technologies that the top boss shouldn't be finding out about a project from the media um, or from a call from John. Um, vendor risk assessment. So was a vendor risk assessment done over Clearview AI um, or, or, or even other parties that were offering facial recognition software? Um, Clearview AI had a security breach at the start of the year. Uh, many cyber security experts are questioning whether they've been uh, you know, fully transparent about the extent of that breach. Google, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter have all issued cease and desist letters against Clearview AI. Uh, the Vermont Attorney General has sued Clearview AI for privacy beach, uh, breaches. Um, police departments in New Jersey and San Diego have been told to stop using the technology. Um, this is all public knowledge. These are all 
red flags. Um, did police check which laws Clearview AI are subject to or claim to be subject to? Did police check if Clearview AI have a public privacy notice or, or a channel for complaints? Possibly. Um, so privacy impact assessments. Uh, privacy impact assessment absolutely should have been done over the trial. Uh, I thought it was interesting to see the detective superintendent in charge of criminal investigations at police um, came out with this statement. Um, police undertook a short trial of Clearview AI earlier this year to assess whether it offered any value to police investigations. This was a very limited trial to assess investigative value. The trial has now ceased and the value to investigations has been assessed as very limited. And the technology at the stage will not be used by New Zealand police. So it's really interesting, I think, that there's this big focus here on whether the technology worked, which is very important, uh, but it's only part of the analysis. So um, here are a few other considerations which should have been picked up in a PIA. Is this technology necessary and proportionate to the risk it's trying to mitigate? Will photos be uploaded to Clearview AI servers and stored overseas? Will Clearview AI sell or use any uploaded photos for their own purposes? Does Clearview AI have any security certifications and will they notify us in the event of a privacy breach? Um, are we using star photos to trial the technology and might they feel obligated to cooperate? Will any photos be deleted at the end of the trial or will they remain in Clearview's control? Um, it may well be that police would accept a number of risks relating to these questions, but they absolutely should have thought about them. Okay, so the key takeaways today. Um, AI encompasses a, a range of technologies and it's already widely used. Uh, it has some fantastic upsides when used well, but there are significant privacy risks when personal information is involved. In particular, uh, over collection of information, reuse of information, a lack of transparency, and biased decision making um, are serious concerns. Uh, if you're looking at implementing AI, you need to understand the legislative environment. There are already existing laws which may apply, the Privacy Act being a key one, and you should be particularly careful if you're in scope for GDPR. You should be as transparent as you can. Uh, and use layered privacy notices where possible. You should consider who might, might be made worse off by the use of AI, because people might miss or try and game the technology. And then finally, improve your data governance by having uh, really clear sign off and risk ownership, and then undertake privacy impact assessments for new and creative uses of personal information. Um, so how can Tubac Labs help? Uh, look, PIAs are our bread and butter. Reach out. If you've got a project you need some assistance with, um, we can also help with end of risk assessments and uh, also compliance obligations um, for, say, the new privacy bill and the GDPR um, if you're in scope.